the future. So first I would like to also um, introduce Lillian Woods, who is our international uh, programs director for NRCS, and, and just to say a few words too. All right, thank you, Maxine. International Programs Division, we're excited to be a part of this. One of the things that we do is we help uh, coordinate and facilitate a visitors exchange such as this is a scientific exchange. It really helps to bring new knowledge to our agency and for our scientists to exchange with uh, visitors from other countries. So this is an exciting presentation. We look forward to it. With this being the International Year of Soils, you know, we take every opportunity to share information about the importance of soils and how it's impacting people's lives. So again, Maxine, thank you for including the International Programs Division, and, and we, we're glad to help facilitate visitors who will come to U U.S. to share information. I also want to mention, as part of this program of, of uh, in inviting scientists to come and visit with us. Uh, we had a very nice day this morning with the Soil Science Division <coughs> National Headquarters and, and learning about the Soil Science Division and the plans for IYS, the International Year of Soils, for the agency. And then we also had a very fruitful visit uh, with some of the folks in um, the Ecological Sciences Division talking about soil health and uh, in general, their programs in science and technology. So I thank those that um, participated this morning with Ivana. In addition, um, we'd like to uh, just have you know and, and give a special shout out and thanks to California because uh, the Soil Science Division Uh, for a series of uh, field, field, field visits as well as um, she'll be repeating this uh, seminar for the University of California, Davis. And, um, and then also she is going to be visiting the Diggit exhibit, uh, the Smithsonian Diggit exhibit, which is uh, being in California um, at the California State Museum in Sacramento, California, quite close to Davis. So at this point, um, I'd like to formally ask Ivana to welcome you and, and to um, introduce yourself just more specifically as to your position and then get going. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Maxine, and others for this opportunity to present our work this afternoon. Um, so I work for the State Government of Victoria in the Department of Environment and Primary Industries, and I'm a research scientist in, in the Soils Division. And for the last five years, I've been working on a soil carbon project of which I'll present today. Most of my work has been coordinating the field programs and the sampling um, for the Victorian component of the project. So I'll get underway with the formal part of the presentation now. So as you can see, I'm presenting on soil carbon stocks in pastures and cropping systems of Victoria, Australia. But for a bit of background, this project was born out of a, a, a soil carbon research program at the national level. So over the last decade, there's been a lot of interest in soil carbon. To research and do some baseline survey, surveys of what the current soil carbon stocks are across Australia. And this was led by our national scientific organisation, the CSIRO. So as you can see, it's a national program and it was a, lo a large number of were all involved in this project. So at a national level, the aims were to quantify the carbon stocks across the country quantify the different compositions, and develop a national soil carbon database. All the dots are what are a single site that was undertaken and sampled as part of the national program. 
and you can see in Victoria in, is down the south east corner. Um, there's quite a few. We're probably one of the most heavily sampled areas in this program. And out of this program, one of the outcomes was to produce a national soil carbon map um, of organic carbon levels in the top 10 centimetres. So we've got a lovely map here now that we can base a lot of our future research on and, and just use as a tool to communicate our findings to the general public. So I'm going to focus in on the Victorian component of this national project, which was the Victorian Soil Carbon Project. It was funded by the federal and state government and also the Research Development Corporation for Grains. And as you can see, we had quite a football team of people who were involved. So the objectives were to measure soil carbon stocks in pasture and cropping systems of Victoria and investigate the relationships with the management soil and climate. So not just going out there and sampling soils, but also understanding how the management and climate interacts with them. So for our methodology, it was standardised across the, the uh, country. And then in Victoria, we split it up into eight regions. And in each region, we focused on the dominant soil types. And then we had a choice of one to four managements. So depending on which region we were in, sometimes we covered one management, other times we covered the, the uh, four managements. So our managements were continuous cropping. Now this is over at least a 10 year period. Uh, crop pasture rotations, sheep beef pastures, or dairy pastures. So this here is a map of our sample locations, and each different colour designates a different management type. So you can see the map is split up into what we term primary production landscapes, which is a function of climate, rainfall, uh, soil types, major agricultural systems that sort of designate the, the regions. It's similar to your MLRAs, yeah. um, which major I learned about land. this morning. Yeah, major so land resource area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see predominantly up in the top left hand corner is typically our drier climates, uh, less than 300 millimetres of rainfall each year, so that's where you get your, your cropping. And as you move further south, we get higher rainfall, so we get into our pasture systems and where we get the highest rainfall of all is where we have our dairy, dairy system. So we sampled over 600 farm sites, plus we also sampled nearly 400 long-term trial plots as part of this study, um, but today my focus will be mainly on the farm sites. The green areas to the right-hand side are mainly forested areas, natural uh, remnant forests, so these were not included in the study. So soil sampling consisted of going out in the field, identifying appropriate landscapes and um, paddocks that were, had the relevant history and in each paddock we set up a 25 by 25 metre grid and we had designated um, nodes where we could take 10 samples from. Each sample was um, down to 0 to 30 centimetres and they were split into 10 centimetre increments with each depth pooled with a total of 10 cores. Around the outside, you might be able to see the blue blue dots. We did these ones down to 90 centimetres and we used these to characterise the site. So we used them to do the profile descriptions to determine what soil type that we had. At each site, we also collected the GPS data um, so that in future we have the potential to go back to them. Um, we used differential GPS so we got an accuracy of less than 10 centimetres. And as part of the work, we also collected 10 years' worth of paddock history from the landholder. So this included things like crops grown, fertilisers, yields, grazing, grazing animals, um, and if it, any cultivation practices such as minimum zero till or whether stubbles were burnt or retained on the surface. So here's a picture of our soil sampling. We pegged out a grid 
the red flags are where we actually took the soil samples from um, and we used a ute mounted hydraulic soil sampler. So this is probably in a paddock in the middle of the state in one of the higher rainfall areas. To obtain the access to the land and the collection of the um, paddock history, we engaged the farmer groups um, across, throughout the state and individually we covered over 420 farmers and we certainly couldn't have done it without them. When it came to soil analysis, as I mentioned, we had our 30 centimetres of soil core split into the 10 centimetre increment depths. We covered mainly organic seas but using the dry combustion method of LECO and we also did MIR analysis. So the soil analysis was a big part of the project because this national project also contributed to obtaining a calibration data set for all the MIRs across the labs in the country. So for this project, every single sample was submitted to the one lab and all analysed using the one MIR. But now that the project's finished and we have this calibration set, um, we are able to use the labs across the rest of the country as well. So other measurements using MIR included nitrogen, soil properties such as clay and silicon, uh, pH, iron and some um, trace elements of aluminium. So for our results, this is in Victoria, you can see that soil carbon varies across a wide range. In the lowest we had 2 tonnes per hectare, up to 239 tonnes per hectare was our highest carbon stocks. So that two tonnes per hectare come from the, the Mallee, which was in the northwest top of the state, uh, undercropping quite a dry climate. Whereas the 232 tonnes was under a clay soil, high rainfall and a dairy, fairly intensive dairy production. And of all the carbon that was measured, half of it was found in the top 10 centimetres and the other half was found between 10 and 30 centimetres. So this picture here shows a, a typical site of what would have been the Mallee, so where we got that two tonnes per hectare. Fairly sandy, it's all the way to depth. Um, because of the low rainfall, they tend to do a lot of wide row spacing in their crops, so there's not a complete ground cover all year round, and it's fairly sparse. This photo here would be from a dairy farm down in one of the higher rainfall zone areas towards the coast. This would be nudging somewhere 220 plus tonnes per hectare of carbon. You can see that it's got quite good clover cover. Uh, we, this picture is actually taken in the middle of summer so you can see how green it is and that he's clearly removed some produce because you can see the silage um, bales in the paddock. And this soil type even though it looks quite variable in the uh, pictures there between the three cores, it's fairly <coughs> distant and it's quite high in clay content. So across Victoria, we found that the soil organic carbon stocks are dependent upon management region, uh, soil type and the management class. Uh, all had highly significant influences. So you can see here our management graph. So cropping sites averaged out to be about 25 tonnes per hectare of soil organic carbon in the top 30 centimetres. Uh, crop pasture rotation about 55, pasture for sheep and beef 70 and then our dairy pastures in the high rainfall uh, 110. If we look at that from a regional perspective, in the Mallee low rainfall uh, you're less than 20, making our way up to approximately 120 tonnes per hectare up in the Otways. So the region that I'm from and we'll probably focus on a little bit more is the Vic Victorian Volcanic Plain. And so this m regional map or graph here covers all the different management classes and soil types. It's clear, it's 
basically just a regional average. We don't differentiate between anything, and I'll go further into that as we move on. If we look at the carbon as a soil type function, uh, again, the tenor soils, which are the predominant soil type in the valley, are quite low, and then the derma soils are quite high. And unfortunately, uh, oh, I'll just go back a step. The ones that I've circled here, the sodasols, vertisols, and the chromosols, they're the three main soil types that we find in the Victorian volcanic plains. But management soil type and region are interrelated, and this influences the results that we can see. So in the previous graph, I showed that um, the dermosols are quite high, but they are in the higher, found in the higher rainfall zones of Victoria and predominantly under the high intensity uh, dairy pastures. Whereas the tenor soles are in the mallee, which is dry, under the cropping and have very little clay in their soil content. This graph might be a bit hard to see, but you can it's basically rainfall on the bottom in millimetres and soil carbon on the y-axis. And you can see as rainfall increases from, through the state, you can see that carbon increases as well. Um, so in the red there is the Mallee, and then the blue is the Otways, which is predominantly the dermosols and the dairy pastures. And rainfall can explain up to 77 of variation that we can see in the organic carbon levels across across the state. So we can explain a fair amount of why, how much carbon is there. When we add in other soil properties, such as the silicon and clay, we can further explain some of the variation in terms of the uh, organic carbon stocks. And this equates to about 10 to 15 percent. So when we add that with the climate variation, we can explain 80 to 85 percent of the variation in, in organic carbon stocks across Victoria from a statewide level. But with, when we get to within the region, it's a bit more of an interesting story. Um, the relationships with organic carbon vary a fair bit. So for example, in the Mallee, which was the low rainfall and sandy soil, Soil texture was a big influence. So I, pretty much the amount of clay or the amount of sand. Um, if we looked at the Otways, which was the high rainfall dairy production, rainfall was the driving factor. In the Vic Volcanic Plains, pretty much everything influenced um, the organic carbon levels. So this. Uh, figure here shows the Vic Volcanic Plains um, with a loam, loamy over clay, so texture contrast soil, so really light on top and then into a heavy clay underneath with a fairly distinct boundary. So you can see for the different managements that the carbon stocks vary from 50 to 104 tonnes per hectare. And you might think, and this is fairly significant, but if we add it, take, in, take rainfall into account, because there is a rainfall gradient across this region as well, um, dairy and sheep, but beef pastures turn out to be the same, and which are greater than the cropping by 17 to 20 tonnes. So from that we learnt that it's not a simple story just to look at the baseline numbers, you have to take into account the rainfall gradients. You know, you might be in the same region, but there's still a gradient across the region. Then we looked at management practices. So this we obtained from our paddock history collection sheets that we asked our farmers to fill out. So we looked at stubble retention, whether they included a fallow in the rotation, their tillage practices and their fertiliser inputs. And then for the pasture systems, we looked at the different types of pastures, what grazing they were doing and also the inputs. 
And at the level that we were looking at, we could not find any significant relationships with the amount of carbon in this between these different management practices. So in conclusion to this part, the Victorian soil carbon varies enormously across the state and it's a hard story to capture from a statewide perspective. If you want to really understand it and drill down on it, you have to talk about it more at a localised level. The order of influence in terms of what can be done about changing carbon, the biggest driver is the climate with over 70% and then soil with your 10 to 15% and then your management classes and practices are negligible at best. Um, so unless you can change your climate, you're not going to be able to change your carbon in too much of a hurry. So yeah, as I mentioned, it's important to know what region we're talking about when we're talking about stocks of carbon and what's, what's a healthy stock and what's an unhealthy stock. So I'll now present some data on what we are currently undertaking um, and these results are pretty well hot off the press. So as a second stage to the Victorian Soil Carbon Project, we undertook some soil and carbon, soil carbon and nitrogen changes of, of, on conversion of long-term pasture to cropping. So we wanted to see basically what the rate of decline was um, around pastures being changed into a cropping system and put some data around it for a Victorian agricultural system. This work had previously been done in Queensland, which is northern Australia, and they'd looked at cultivation and cropping systems of converting to the permanent pastures and they'd seen some pretty good um, declines in the organic carbon and they could actually graph it quite well with an exponential decline under the cropping. So we went out to test this theory to see whether it was similar in a Victorian cropping system. So our hypothesis was much similar to the Queenslanders that we expected to see a decline exponentially with over time in carbon and nitrogen. So our approach to this was to take the thick volcanic plains region because this is a, a region that has undergone land management change a fair bit in the last 10 years with the climate drying up. It has enabled many traditional pasture based systems to now include cropping in their systems and move to a more permanent cropping. Um, so we paired up approximately 40 sites uh, one pasture, one cropping. Um, ideally they were sort of fence line, over the fence line from each other, but they could have been uh, up to a K away. And we concentrated on, on texture contrast soils to eliminate any soil factors. So for our site selection, our pastures needed to be at least 30 year old continued improved pastures on a sheep and beef system. and no renovations in the last five years. And then for our cropping systems, we wanted a range from one to 30 plus years and that had been previously long-term pasture. So some, we got a range from one through to 38 years. We had quite a few between one and sort of 15 because that's what the majority of the region has sort of been the last 15 years that they've converted but we did find some out to, to 20 to 30 years. We had to ensure that there was no, no pastures in the rotation, so it needed to be a continuous cropping system, and it had to be a flat land cropping. We didn't want any raised beds. Um, so in the Vic Volcanic Plains, a lot of the cropping systems have included raised beds at some stage because we tend to get a lot of rainfall and by including the raised beds, we can eliminate the waterlogging that the crop may suffer from. 
Um, but there are areas where they do not use raised beds, so this was what we targeted. And we, between each cropping and pasture site, we had to match the two sites by position in the landscape. So if one was on the top of a crest, we wanted the other on the crest. We didn't want one on the crest and one in the valley down below. Ideally, they were located next to each other so that the rainfall was the same. We wanted similar soil textures and similar gravel content. So this shows our pairings. Um, you probably don't need to get too detailed into it, but the orange bars are the uh, cropping sites and the green ones are the pasture sites. So you can see that our on rainfall, our pairs match up reasonably quite well and they do pretty well on the gravel content as well. And then we also did the same for the clay content and the sand content with our pairs. So this was just to ensure that we weren't including any biases that might have been, uh, um, that could influence soil carbon content. So for the soil sampling, we use the same procedure and methodology as the um, SCARP method or Victorian Soil Carbon Project as we did the first time around. And we did much the same MIR analysis uh, with the focus on nitrogen and carbon and calculated the stocks to 0 to 30 centimetres. And I will say one thing that has come out of the national program is Equivalent mass calculations is very important for determining soil carbon stocks and being able to analyse across the country, across sites, across regions, because um, bulk density is a very important calculation in calculating the carbon stocks and it varies hugely across Australia. So equivalent mass calculations are what's being used to do the comparisons. So you can see here is an example of some of our paired sites. So up the top left hand corner we've got a, a cereal crop uh, of some sort, probably wheat, and then we've compared that with the pasture in the top right hand corner. And then on the bottom we've got a canola crop um, compared with the pasture on the bottom right hand corner. So they're typical sites that we sampled to undertake the paired analysis. So the results from this study are that there was a fairly good relationship between organic carbon and rainfall for the two management classes, but it certainly doesn't show anything like, uh, and the same with total nitrogen, it was, we were quite happy with that. But when it comes to the amount of cropping years of cropping and the organic carbon tons per hectare and equivalent mass, there's quite a lot of variation and we certainly didn't get the the tightness of the curves and the exponential decline that the Queenslanders saw when they converted from their system. So we tried the tact of looking at the change in organic carbon and to the years of cropping and again there's no nice relationship that we were expecting, so it's quite a surprise. And we did the same with nitrogen, uh, much the same story. So in conclusion, the duration of cropping for the Victorian agricultural systems in the Vic Victorian volcanic plains is not an accurate um, prediction to predict the decline in soil carbon and nitrogen across the region and the long term pastures hence may not be a suitable baseline in which to assess the current conditions and changes under cropping. And the paired site approach may be difficult to interpret even when pairing seems to be adequate. So now our next step is to go back and recheck our pairs and, and look at them a bit closer and and uh, see if we can make some more light of the data, try and understand the story a bit better. 
So thank you for your time and I'll now take some questions. All right, at this time is uh, you have the Q&A pod that you can enter your question and we'll take those uh, as they come in. Is there anyone in the room with me that has a question? Okay. Or anyone in the room with you, Maxine? Well, I, I might um, bring up one piece of information. We had quite a bit of discussion this morning about um, laboratory techniques and the MIR um, techniques that were used in Australia. And I, I just leave Ivana yep. to um, give a little more detail on that. Um, while we were undertaking the Victorian Soil Carbon Project, another colleague of mine was retracing some steps and going back to some old trial sites that were set up in the late 60s, early 70s. Back at that stage, the sites were sampled and tested for organic carbon, pH, few trace elements, etc. Anyway, at the same time, he decided to go back and find these sites and resample to measure the changes in the pH and carbon. And one of the interesting things that came out of that project was the efficiency of the methodologies the analytical methodologies have improved in the last 40 years. So back in the 70s, they used the Walkley Black method to determine the carbon percentage, and they did exactly the same thing um, a couple of years ago. And the soil samples from two years ago showed an increase in soil carbon, which was completely unexpected and didn't line up with anything that should have happened. So. They eventually worked it out and it was that the efficiency of the Walkley Black method has improved in the labs um, over the last 40 years. So they obtained some archived soil samples of the original samples from the sample 70s and reanalyzed them with today's methods and found that soil carbon had actually decreased. Um, so it's interesting, you have to be careful which methodologies and even though you might use the same methodology um, from years gone by, lab, the efficiencies can be improved in the lab just by small, small amounts, which can make a big difference. We do have a couple of questions that have come in online. The first one is uh, someone writes in, they're surprised that the cropping is concentrated in low rainfall regions and pasture in higher rainfall areas. Could you comment on that? Yeah, that's just a function of rainfall and the productivity. Um, the low, higher rainfall regions tend to have the more pastures because it simply rains more, so you can you can make more money and more production from having your animals. Um, in the lower rainfall areas, it's not conducive to have too many animals all year round because typically they tend to run out of water stocks, so they don't have the water to to give to their animals, so that's why they predominantly go cropping. Another question online, have there been any efforts in Australia to increase carbon stocks, and if so, how did they work? Well, that's what everybody's trying to figure out at the moment. Um, that's why I presented the data on our sort of part two, because we were hoping that we could show the rate of decline and if we could stop the rate of decline that could be as much as a win as increasing the carbon stocks. There's a lot of work going around the country looking at different um, methodologies and techniques so it's all pretty new at the moment still. All right and another question what have you seen with soil carbon on continuous no-till specific to crops used in rotation? We haven't really seen a lot. Um, it was hard to quantify in this study because it was such a broad scale study. Um, we would need to do long term site specific studies. There is a long term cropping trial in the Mallee, in, the, in that low rainfall area, that's been going on for nearly 30 years. and 
we did sample it as part of the Victorian Soil Carbon Project and it's only now that we're just seeing some slight significant differences in the levels of carbon between uh, conventional tillage and your, your minimum tillage practice.